Good. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. On behalf of Switzerland Global Enterprise and of um, Home of Blockchain, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on the topic of data security and AI sovereignty. It's a topic that every company executive um, should have on their radar. And we will look at Switzerland and what role Switzerland can play in this. So a big thank you goes to our speakers, Roger, Carla, Colin and Fabio, and also to our moderator, Alexander. Um, and the discussion will be recorded, so you can also look at it or um, hear it later on. Um, and also, if you have any questions, uh, I hope you have some, your own burning questions to our panelists. Please write them in a the chat. You see them on a on a site, and we can include them in a discussion during the discussion, or then at the end we have some time as well. So with this, I would like to hand over to Alexander Brunner. He's the president of Home of Blockchain, and he will be moderating the discussion today. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sirpa. Good morning, good, good afternoon. Uh, I'm running an organization home of blockchain. We're promoting Switzerland's blockchain ecosystem. We're also active in AI, so that's, I guess, why I'm moderating this. Let me quickly introduce you our panel and what we're going to discuss next hour. And I think is we have a very interesting panel for two reasons. A, we have a nice mix of big corporates and smaller uh, innovative organizations. And secondly, we have organizations from Switzerland and abroad so we're going to have a nice perspective uh, from sort of a global view uh, as a quick introduction uh, first we have carla bunger uh, she's the co-founder and board, board member of phoenix technologies you're providing data sovereign so solutions uh, in the quantum space and in the ai space you've been in tech for a very long long uh, at time, multiple uh, entrepreneur. Thank you for having you. Then on the more uh, uh, the corp corporate side of the Swiss side, we have Roger Zeus. Uh, Roger is the CEO of Green.ch. They're uh, one of the big data center provider, a homegrown data center provider. You've been active for many years, uh, building data centers and offering solutions to all sorts of clients. Uh, and uh, you also worked in banking for a long time, so you're very familiar with what are the demands in a highly regulated industry. Uh, we also have Fabio Keller, also based in Switzerland. You are with IBM. I think we don't need to use IBM, but you have been focusing on two areas that are very close to me. One, digital assets, crypto, blockchain, and, and as well as compute that is pri 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 privacy uh, relevant, that is a uh, confidential so you have a technical as well as a business aspect uh, from a, a big provider and last but not least we have colin dialing in from boston at about 3 a.m i was told so great that you still look sparkling uh, colin is the co-founder and ceo of via science you're providing data security solutions to the U.S. Department of Defense, to the U.S. Gulf government, and Europe has also a representative office here in Switzerland working with Swiss clients. So you have the perfect view from what's happening in the U.S. and what's happening in Switzerland. And, and with that, I'd like to kick off uh, our seminar, a web, web webinar, where we sort of, in the last two years, since the advent of OpenAI's ChatGPT, there's a lot of discussion about what can AI models do or AI agents that the current discussion is that we're expecting to have lots of AI agents in the future. So those little robots that know us very well, and they will do all sorts of tasks in a private uh, setting as well as in a corp corporate setting. So that's been a lot of the discussed. We won't discuss that bit, but we will discuss the bit that will enable all of that. And, and it, it's if you read the, the recent news from the big tech companies in the US, they just announced, according to Bloomberg, they're going to invest 200 billion in, in infrastructure that enables AI. And when they talk about that, it's about where do you keep your data in data centers. Elon Musk famously recently built in a few weeks, apparently, a massive data center in Memphis. And I listened to a podcast with Jensen Wang, the CEO of NVIDIA. He said he's going to see in the very near future data centers with 1 million H100 chips. And if you can cal cal calculate how much they are, you're talking about billions just for the chips, and then you need to have cooling and energy. But the question begets is, where is all, all, all this data? And I think recently I've been discussing to a senior executive of a bank that was very enthusiastic about AI's potential, but because of this deployment, they started to ask, what actually happens with my data? And one of the ideas 
that's been discussed is in AI agents that they sort of know your organization and your processes very, very well. So they can start interacting and do, you know, client requests and book things and just become active. But if that's going to be the future as an organization, you want to know where your data is. You want to know that no one can manipulate. You want to know that you can access the data. And in the past, we've seen uh, the CrowdStrike incidents with Microsoft was a good, good example that certain systems are very connected. And if one little switch doesn't turn on, a lot of bad things happen. So this is the discussion today, and I'm really excited to delve in, into that and, and have a bit of a discussion. What do you need so you can sleep well at night as an executive organization and don't have to worry too much about data? And obviously, why Switzerland is a great location for, for that. With that, uh, I want to kick it off, or maybe, maybe first to our Swiss client, maybe we start with Carla. Uh, you are very, you've been in blockchain digital assets, now you're in AI. What's what, what's the impact of AI in Switzerland? What do you see here? Yes, so good morning. Thank you for this question. Um, the impact of AI in Switzerland is, is so we have two, two, two fold um, elements. One is uh, increased efficiency of, of employees, of teams, of um, processes. Um, that's a quite low hanging fruit. Um, most companies are in full process of implementing this in their organizations. Um, and once the security has been somehow approved by the relevant uh, responsible people, this is something that is now deployed in companies not only in Switzerland, but across the world. When it gets a little bit tougher is the, the generative AI applications that are tailored um, to the companies and basically the applications where you have to train language models with your proprietary data in order to rethink processes, in order to restructure how things are done inside of companies and to really create um, uh, impactful um, generative AI um, results. And this is where um, it's going to be complicated. It takes a bit more time. Um, you have to find the right application. But first of all, it's exactly where um, the questions are asked. Where is my data? Who is access? Who can tamper with it? How do I make sure that this very powerful tool that I'm going to train and deploy um, is accurate on one hand and is very safe where it is stored? Um, and these questions are the ones that are occupying the CTOs in Switzerland and worldwide quite heavily at this point of time. And this is why sovereignty and security is so important. It's interesting. I read this this week that UBS decided to use Microsoft's co-pilot. They're going to roll this out to 50,000 employees. So that's obviously the US high hyperscalers. Microsoft can provide the data centers with Azure. They can now deploy the, the provide deployment. It seems to be the easy thing. If you're on Microsoft, you just use that. But maybe moving to you, Roche, as US, you've been providing data service and data infrastructure for a long time. Why, why should a, a corporation also consider going for a local provider versus just going for the big US high scalers that are sort of cheap and ubiquitous. But well, what's your view? Now how he froze. Is it just me or I shocked him with this question? He froze. I don't know. <laughs> he froze. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know what? I'll 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 just maybe maybe we we, we come back to him later, but you mentioned the security, Carla. Carla, no, yes. no, no, yes. no, 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 no. Or is it just, uh, it well, just, I'll ask uh, Fabio a well, question, you can join. There's a bit of an echo. Can you hear yeah, myself? I, I, I just screened from uh, my phone, actually, uh, because that's the beauty of, uh, that's the beauty of the cloud, uh, let's say. My laptop just decided, you know, that corporate automation that you mentioned before, so it decided to reboot and uh, get the latest okay. installment. Uh, the beauty is that you can switch to another device, which uh, is now my cell phone, and it still works. Um, so, if, if you if you don't mind, can you quickly repeat the question because I was just uh, tuned out. At that sure, point. no worries. Uh, I mean, you used to work in banking. You had executive roles in big banks. Yeah. Microsoft and UBS recently announced, I think even this week. 
that UBS is going to move 50,000 employees onto this AI agent environment by my Microsoft, the co-pilot environment. So that sounds very easy. If you're already with my Microsoft as a corporation, you just seem to be, you know, switch it on. So my question to you, Roger, is that seems to be the easy solution. Why should corporations and decision making think about using a local service as well? What's what's your pitch uh, to use a Swiss host or data center? Yeah, I, I think so. That this two elements to it. So I think if you look at uh, any of the big cloud provider solutions, Microsoft being one of them, um, when whenever they look at data sovereignty, they also will either partner with local data center providers or they will go and, and build their own, right? So now in Switzerland, um, the decision so far from, from all of those vendors, uh, whom a lot of them are clients of us, uh, was that they actually deploy local with uh, providers like us um, in order to kind of keep that data security. But of course, those services are very, um, very specifically geared to their uh, technologies. You know, Copilot is a great example. So it basically gets across your, uh, your uh, ecosystem. It's not uh, covering all AI use cases. If we look at uh, AI more generally, and I, I, I think even on, on your impact question before, um, uh, really sort of AI will impact any nation that's heavily service bound and sort of a service developed type nation. Switzerland particularly is one of those. And so, uh, when when we have the discussions around AI, we see a much broader application. So whether it's uh, uh, additional health data, whether it's even uh, driving new uh, forward with new drugs or new uh, uh, development. So it really becomes basically your your um, um, you know your, your consultant, your uh, uh, strategy agent that that you can tap into on a, on a numerous uh, level. Levels. And that's where, uh, as Carla was mentioning before, where suddenly data becomes extremely important. So not only does the data have to be transparently submitted to that AI technology in order to, to learn, and that, that could even be the case if you start with an already trained large, large language model, but you sort of retrain it specifically on your data, all that training data needs to be transparently fed. And then, of course, as you get to inference, so actually using um, uh, AI as a technology, again, you know, the, 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 the tech needs to get sort of those questions and the data uh, in, in full transparency. And that sort of very much drives uh, not just regulated, but but anybody that cares about data drives them to think about how they store it and how they protect it. And, and so that's where you see uh, specifically Switzerland with such a high uh, data security standard that, that people are asking and saying, you know, uh, how, how do I do this? And, and how do I even get to a hybrid setup where I use cloud for certain things. There's going to be great tech on, on those cloud solutions, but how do I drive my AI strategy uh, forward on a, on a company level and how do I do that securely? And, and that's, I think, where really the Swiss solutions sort of stand out. I yes, yesterday listened to two US experts in data security and they told me like already 10 years ago, the income, the revenues from cyber threats or cyber crime has been bigger than the entire drug trade in the world. <laughs> so just to put things in perspective, so it seems to be a massive industry that's been around and now we have AI. So everyone is going to use even more data, more processing. So Fabio, you are passionate about security. And most people I know is like myself, whenever the system wants to update or you have to do a phishing test, everyone is annoyed. You Seem to be excited when it comes to security you know the technology aspect my question is has ai fundamentally changed the game or has it just accelerated a problem that's been around before how do you see that uh that's a very good question and i think from my perspective the way i perceive it it hasn't changed a lot because people that do not care about security they also do not care about security in ai on the other hand, they should 
be super careful because you put your your crown jewel data, your knowledge of your company, you typically put it in this AI um, bot or whatever solution you, you put in place. And if that data is is tampered or is the training data is is not of good quality or has been misused, all the answers that you get out of this AI solution or the, from the inferencing then will be also becoming rogue. And this is, I think, a big risk that companies have to deal with. And the best thing to, to prevent from that is to have a super secure solution, um, put additional barriers in place in order to increase the, the security posture in the sense of um, know where your data is, encrypt the data, have it somewhere close to where you use the data. I think that's another aspect. IBM is, is not only looking for AI solution that give you answer, but also is looking and optimizing in the direction that the answer is um, with the lowest possible cost that includes the, the answer. And I think this is super important. You, you can have the biggest LLM, but if all of a sudden you get a, a large number of requests on this LLM, it, it just kills you in terms of cost. So there is an efficiency question combined with the security that people should, or I would recommend to look after and to carefully, carefully design it and make wise decision where you put your data and how you, you store it and how you manage it overall. And technology can be a, a good enabler for doing that. Um, if you go the, the, the furthest, I would even go to confidential computing in combination with local sovereignty. Could and you quickly explain what that influence. means, Fabio? Confidential compute, just for our audience. Confidential computing, so far we are quite used to have data encrypted once they are stored. We are used to some extent um, to, to encrypt data while it is in transit. Also, we go on HTTPS web pages instead of HTTP because the transmission is encrypted. And with confidential computing, you get the third element that is data in use. Once the data is sitting on your server or within your computer, that data is encrypted so that a cloud administrator or somebody that has access to your server cannot copycat the data from the memory and extract it. So that you have the full protection data in use, data in transit and data in store. These are the three ingredients that we consider for um, confidential computing. You mentioned something about you know security and how to maintain that. And uh, in, in a corporate setting, obviously, you want to make sure that client from private data, confidential data doesn't get, get leaked. One organization that cares a lot about not leaking information is the U.S. Department of Defense and the, the, uh, the intelligence agency. Colin, uh, you mm -hmm. told me once that the NSA put up a statement and looked it up. And the NSA, in a very wordy way, basically says parameter, parameter defenses. So you know, keeping the entire service structure uh, secure doesn't work anymore. And that's sort of a bit alluding to what Bob said. How do you see uh, from a US perspective uh, this problem of keeping things safe from server? And as you're operating in two environments, are there any differences between the US and Switzerland? Uh, first, let me say, Grüezi uh, miteinander. Ich freue mich, Sie kennenzulernen. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think it's a great question. Alexander, I think security is everyone's concern. Um, I think uh, first we, you know, to Fabio's point about the confidential computing is a good one. We we often don't. We, you're talking about data sovereignty, which means the the ownership of the data by the country, right? By an, by, and that actually turns out, you know, we're big believers that everyone should own their own data, actually, and you know, taking that to the extreme. All of these, you know, cell phone devices often have the since iPhone five or earlier Android, they actually have two chips on them. They have the main chip that's used for general storage and your very secure things like uh, when you need to sign digitally sign something or you need to uh, store your private key for encryption. That's done on a second chip. 
right? And the, all of us running on laptops here or the, our viewers and the audience, I, I'm betting 95% of you don't even know you have a second chip in your laptop that's meant for some of this very high-end security. We're already building it in in different places, and so keeping it in the in the in country matters uh, for for a lot of reasons. I think your your question about security is a uh, um, people are uh, you know the you can build higher and thicker walls to protect data. That means putting, as you said, sort of this network security, but. There are a lot of people already who have breached those walls, and so protecting the data asset itself with things, you know, with higher levels of encryption or uh, protecting the data by uh, knowing where it's going and who's accessing it, uh, keeping an audit of uh, of those transactions is also, you know, another way of uh, another layer of protection from a technical standpoint. So there's lots of innovation. There's uh, the AI is the sexy bit that people talk about because you can chat to it and you know see photos created and videos, but the protection piece is moving very fast from a technical perspective as well. Maybe delving a bit deeper into that. Recently, I've been you know part of presentations. So I'm not going to say who, but U.S. cloud providers say you're safe with us. You know we respect any law. Our data is safe. Then there's other, there's actually the, the data authority of the Canton of Syria saying, well, the Cloud Act in the US basically lets you access anything. Anyhow, so those are the two discussions. And I'd really like to open this up to the panel without picking anyone in particular. How do you see that? And, and does that, you know, is data in, this, in Switzerland truly more safe or secure versus uh, provided by a US provider? How do you, what, what, what are the trade offs someone has to look at? Obviously, being with a big hyperscaler seems to be easy. Uh, but it comes with true, true, true downs. Well, what are the discussions you're having with your clients? Colin raised his hand. Very good. So maybe you, you, you quickly Absolutely. start, and then we open it up to the rest of the panel. Yeah, if I could uh, just, uh, I think that um, you know, the, uh, you're right that there are the big hyperscalers, Microsoft, AWS, etc., are all based in the United States, but they're global players, right? They want to, and the one thing though is that. The U.S. is very fragmented. You talk about a single U.S., but you can see we just had an election here. Like there's a lot of different. Yeah, there's it's it, there is there's not many things that are actually run at a federal level or a country nationwide level. So there is no national law related to data protection. Right, the data protection law will vary by country by state that you're in. Um, Something that I think that we like about Switzerland a lot is there is very clear legislation at a, a national level, and there's a great court of law. So if there are issues, you know what's going to happen, and you know that you can count on the courts, right, to be fair. And and that is a that you know that's a reason that people choose large organizations choose to operate in certain jurisdictions and not others. And so um, you know we we like you know we operate in Switzerland because irrespective of where. Uh, you know where we're doing business. We can always point to the Swiss law and say, "This is clear. What's ha you know we adhere to these standards, and if the Swiss like it, that must be a good standard." Right? Uh, last thing I'll say, you know, I, I that's true even in the U.S. where. Um, as in this sort of weird divided where if I, I visited Oklahoma, for example, or the, the, the deep south and to say we operate in Switzerland and we adhere to the Swiss laws, people got that. Right now, they may or may not like California or New York. You know, that's how divided the country may be. But actually, from a international perspective, it's like, oh, Switzerland, that's great. You know, we like the fact you operate, you understand those laws, and are you know working with that. That's a high standard. Yeah, I I, I think I would add. You know, I I had the the pleasure to sort of uh, run the uh, uh, banking association working group uh, on uh, uh, cloud use you know back uh, quite a few day a few years now and and the interesting bit really was that um, exactly how 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 Colin was saying you know the fundamentals was in the legal system how how does switzerland actually act and react even in cases of a, a, a US Cloud Act uh, approach. And, and so you see the, the various uh, cloud providers and of course the Swiss 
companies um, e even more sort of uh, integrated into that legal system. But but even the the U.S. companies they normally operate under subsidiaries within country, um, and then and then the formal way a U.S. Cloud Act gets enforced is actually through a legal system. And I think um, in addition of sort of having a high standard, you know, the Swiss quality that. That, that is known for uh, the, the, the great uh, academia that we have that sort of also put a lot of effort behind security. Uh, I think the other thing that people um, really uh, like about Switzerland is that it's not a country that switches laws or changes politically very quickly. It's a very clear process on how we um, get to new laws. And, and so something that's extremely important for businesses is predictability, right? And so they actually like um, that that Switzerland doesn't with a, a change of president or a, pre, a change of political party, given how, how the, con the whole constitution sort of works here, uh, that of a sudden you have big swings, you know, whether it's left, right, or whether it's any any other sort of um, uh, understanding. So, so that predictability is, is quite neat. And then the last thing I would say, and, and it goes uh, a bit hand in hand, as you look maybe at Europe in general, you know, Switzerland is in the middle of Europe geographically, but it also has, and an actually um, about a year ago, maybe two uh, officially um, got accepted in terms of how it uh, runs with data security and GDPR. So where in other cases, you're not quite sure are you fully secure and also compliant as you operate with other states? Um, Switzerland really got to that level where the European Union accepts the way Switzerland handles data as GDPR compliant, and yet goes even even a step further. So I think that that sort of makes it quite unique and 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 quite ideal to sort of even counteract or or at least uh, get the protection you need even in a in a global sort of setup where you uh, deal with multiple entities maybe ping back on that and looking at our other panelists what do you see among your clients what is the key drivers what are they looking for is it the rule of law i guess the ones who are in switzerland accept that but if you look at at european countries or other countries what are they looking for if they're looking for data centers or services? And maybe just as for the audience, it's interesting that Switzerland also has a supercomputer, by the way. It's a Swiss Alps computer in Lugano. It has more than 10,000 h 100 So there's even the technical know-how in Switzerland, how to deal with that. Is that beneficial or not? Or is it about price or what are clients looking for? What, what do you see? Uh, I would like to highlight that we have two supercomputers in Switzerland now. One is in Excuse Lugano, the other yours. one is in Basel. <laughs> 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 Where in Basel, we're trying to uh, bring quantum computing to a commercial acceptable um, use case. Um, and this can only be done with supercomputers. So that's why we're working heavily with that. But coming back to your question, um, Alexander, I think um, Swiss Swiss companies are looking for Swiss data centers because of regulation, um, especially companies that don't want to have or cannot have any exposure to um, any power abroad. So that would be the banking industry um, relating to the banking secrecy, but also, of course, all the healthcare and life science industry everywhere where um, personal data is included, um, you are um, stipulated by um, law to make sure that this data is not leaving the country. But then international um, agencies, bodies, companies who are um, putting their data to Switzerland are really interested exactly in the in the few topics that um, Roger mentioned before. Very stable country, um, rule of law, um, and yeah, kind of democracy. So you, you know that this is all legit and it's it's somehow managed by the people and not by a um, government that can change every four years. I mean, in Switzerland, I don't know if you are aware, but I think most Swiss people are not even aware, uh, able to cite you the seven uh, ministers that are ruling the country. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's, so we have a government that is 
kind of invisible if you want but very very stable and um you don't even care but, who's really ruling Carla, are you contrasting so, it to another other, other big country across the board a little uh, bit the pond, a little where bit. it's a bit more visible <laughs> a little bit <laughs> but okay. i i dare you alexander i'm sure you cannot cite the seven ministers that are ruling switzerland today don't don't put me on the spot uh, i have to ask <laughs> chat i i will care probably most of them i will take a while <laughs> yeah I think as well, it's the combination of multiple factors that makes it so attractive. It's the maturity of, of our system and also the, the history that we have built over a couple of hundred years to be reliable and somehow um, stable. And then if you combine this with a zero knowledge uh, approach, I think you're well off if you have data close to you and or have it close to uh, or have it stored within Switzerland, then you are on a on a solid base, I would say. And uh, it's a good starting point to to grow further and to to make decisions. What kind of data is really crown jewel data that needs to stay uh, safe and what kind of data the parking lot or the meeting room reservation system where you say, I do not care if that gets loose, things like that. Roger, you'd uh, like it, to add something? Yeah, yeah if, I, if I may uh, um, add something, uh, I, I think one thing that sort of didn't get mentioned yet, but, but sort of very much comes up normally uh, regarding that question that Alexander, you asked, is sort of that that cost and competitiveness, right? And I, I think there's almost like two elements that, that now come together. I mean, as you travel Switzerland as a tourist, you know, you, you tend to see uh, uh, decently high prices. A lot of that is driven by labor. And so Switzerland, by by nature of being competitive, always had to uh, approach things a bit differently. So you, you really had to drive sort of a service type nation. You had to uh, think twice about how you create efficiency, how you deploy automation in order to be competitive. And of course, one thing that we also use quite neatly is taxes. And so on the efficiency side, I, I think now we almost get supercharged with AI, right? So like there is an element where uh, you can even get better and, and leaner and scale with less people using AI. And, and so uh, Switzerland really very well managed in, in terms of of hosting and, and, and sort of de delivering this type of services to be competitive even on a on a cost level. And and the tax thing I, I wanted to mention because it, it particularly was interesting for some of our clients, you know, as they bring in tech um, in order to run their services. Um, the Swiss has a has a quite neat sort of view on taxation now. Of course, we are we we will have a lot of months and debates around tariffs, you know. Um, Switzerland doesn't know that really. They uh, Switzerland uh, does trade with everybody. And, um, and, and one thing that the companies experience with others, if they bring in tech, they get taxed on bringing in that technology. Um, in Switzerland, as long as you use it for yourself or the service that you uh, offer, you get uh, tax um, sort of uh, waivers, and that helps a lot. So, so that whole myth of uh, you know the coffee at Bahnhofstrasse for a ridiculous amount of money and business that doesn't that that's not the same. You can run extremely efficiently. Colin, you would like to add? Yeah, I yes. just had a. I I think uh, Roger's uh, right deck the. Um, cost does matter, but and Switzerland is a reputation for high cost. But I think it uh, has a. It, we found it quite cost effective, and particularly because quality matters too, right? And the uh, Switzerland ha it has an excellent reputation and long standing around engineering. If you think about the whether that's supercomputers, quantum computers, thousands of GPUs, these are big engineering tasks, right? And uh, there's a reason why Switzerland had the first super collider, right? Or in the world, or um, you know, when you think of 
actually, I don't know many people know this, every single uh, nuclear submarine that's in the US fleet has their steering columns made by Swiss company, right? Swiss engineering, right? And uh, the a lot of, again, these devices, these cell phone devices use Carl Zeiss lenses, right? The, the optical lenses are from mm -hmm. Switzerland. And the reason is, in a way, I don't, big organizations don't actually care about one country versus another. They care about the best. <laughs> they care about having the highest quality and for the right uh, value of price. And I think Switzerland offers that in a way that if for these kinds of tasks, Switzerland offers that, uh, that other countries, you know, find it hard to compete. And so, I, you know, I think it's, there's a merit base to this, not to, uh, that, that we found very compelling. And Maybe let, me, let me add from, here from a, another point that we've been um, justifying why Switzerland based on, on, on the past. If I would like to make a forward looking statement, I would also bring in the discussion on quantum and quantum safety. And I think um, you not only have to, to look what is best today, but you also to take care of what will soon be one of, of our problems that we have to solve. And here clearly come quantum to the table and you need to address those challenges all around quantum computing and, and quantum safe encryption. You need knowledge and you need innovative solutions and engineering what Colin just mentioned. You need engineers that work out solutions for the next level. And I think the, the universities that we have here in Switzerland in combination with the research divisions from multi, uh, um, from, from many companies, also big multinational ones like IBM, <laughs> our research lab is almost 60 years here in Switzerland. That's not a coincidence, you know. This is the different puzzle pieces that needs to fit together in order that you come up with those in engineering solution, what uh, Colin just mentioned, you're looking for the best for certain uh, applications. Yeah, us saying it is one thing, right? But I think where I, what I really like is that Switzerland sort of, repeatedly um, topped, you know, the charts of third party sort of looking at uh, uh, competitiveness and innovation and so forth. And and, and so I, I think it's something that really um, got reiterated also by, by other third parties looking at the market, you know, that the most recent one is around digitization. So even there, uh, we're sort of number two, just behind Singapore. So uh, little Switzerland in Asia, as they call themselves sometimes, uh, sort of uh, very much competing with us there. But 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 yeah, I I think uh, uh, I really can only echo what what Colin and Fabio just mentioned. Maybe now, as we were sort of uh, unconscious of time, and Siapa, you let us know when you want to start Q and A, or if you want to collect Q and A's, let us know. But now, data, data sovereignty is this bigger view, you know, more on a country view. I know as a fact that I've been told that the U.S. intelligence agencies are storing data in Switzerland as well. So there seems to be a, a thumbs up by by the U.S. intelligence agencies. They think that Switzerland is a good uh, location for that. But now as, as this uh, becomes like a race, the AI race, some people say, you know, it's U.S. versus China. And there's a lot of aspects of that. Uh, is, and then we have the EU AI Act that has a very specific type of looking at, at LLMs and training data. Is that a question? What's your view when you look more towards the government sector? Is the government aware of that? Are governments aware of that? Are they still lost in translation? How do you see that? Do you see governments being aware of the problem? Is it a problem? And how do they tackle it? Any one of you has any experience from maybe your clients or uh, interactions with the authorities? So if I may take up can... this question, so um, you say uh, government is our government aware of that? Maybe a few words about the EU AI Act. Um, it has been discussed quite intensively why the EU has been moving so fast and why they have been um, eager to put out um, an, a regulation um, that covers this subject so broadly as one of the first um, regulative bodies in the world. Um, and all the other countries are looking at the EU AI Act and are thinking of whether they should do something similar or whether they should just wait. 
um, the discussion often is between are we um, suffocating progress innovation in AI by regulating it too fast? Um, do we already know enough to regulate it now? And, um, and in essence, yes, um, the opinions are divergent, I would say, but it's important to put out a first regulation piece just to also start thinking about it and say what is good, what is bad, what can we adapt anyway? This is not something that is um, set in stone, but will have to evolve over time. Um, and I think in general, uh, governments are thinking about how to regulate the topic. And I mean, in the end, regulation is there to protect um, companies and citizens of the country. So this, the aim of regulation is to protect from harm. And, and so all governments are looking into AI regulation in general and are discussing and debating how to regulate if and how fast and how much. I think Switzerland, as usual, has a very pragmatic approach. Um, in general, it's said that uh, Switzerland has a very good regulatory framework that covers all new technologies that come up um, and don't really need to regulate something or a technology in its specificity, which is which is quite quite an interesting approach. So um, small countries tend to be very fast in regulating because it's less complex. Um, and this is where I would really, even if the EU AI Act is not perfect and many people criticize it. Um, it has been a masterpiece to be put out that fast and to put out a document that is discussed that heavily um, um, is, is a masterpiece. So that has been a huge success. Um, just the fact that they put out a regulation together um, in that volume um, is in general quite a big achievement. Yeah, I just hope, uh, and, and you mentioned it at the beginning, you know, I, I think Europe is known for for its regulatory capability, right? And and so I, yes. I don't think that you win, that, that you basically win uh, advancement by regulation, but but so it's a it's a fine line to uh, to sort of give guidance, right? And and to say, yeah, give guidance uh, actually in the end, but 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 still not suffocate as you as you mentioned uh, innovation and and so I think that's where I like uh, the the Swiss sort of way of looking at it. So we we normally have the EU sort of uh, go in and and come up with the great regulations, and then Switzerland sort of does a a Swiss finish, and then normally sort of. Uh, try to kind of hold the balance a little bit. So, so I do think that's that's important, especially as we're early days. I we haven't brought it up yet, but but I'm personally quite keen on seeing, particularly the big tech, sort of take responsibility and take alignment seriously um, uh, with regards to the big large language models. What I sort of thought was quite interesting, and I just had that discussion yesterday uh, with one of the hardware vendors that that really underpin uh, a lot of those clouds and and uh, and also AI in particular it was sort of there was that view that there's going to be just a number of super large language models as we know them from uh, Tesla and you know open AI and so forth but then the second wave is going to be much more the uh, the smaller ones or the add-ons that the companies actually do that drive a big sort of personal company level value uh, of course the you know the pay, uh, picture painting and the the chatbots are super interesting because they're sort of available for everybody but but the question is how much true value do they drive uh, as soon as you put it to the task um, of um, of actual use, that's that's where it starts to reap a lot of a lot of value, and that's also where you do have to have a, a base level of of protection or or at least sanity um, uh, for for the population. And so, getting that balance right, I think, is going to be super key. I've just been reading through the chat, and that topic really came up what we've just been discussing. And I think one question is. How does Switzerland deal with this EU AI Act? What are uh, just throw 
happening. I'm not sure about the quantum computer, but I talked to the gentleman who's running or setting up the supercomputer, and they say they're going to be a EU AI Act compliant. So whatever they're offering in the future, their 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 LLM will be compliant. How, how do you see that? How do you see the interaction of Switzerland with the EU in the face of the EU AI Act and GDPR? I think you already mentioned that a bit. We're very good in in, in actually adhering to these uh, standards. Is that true? Is it for a company easy to set up here and then uh, uh, expand to Europe? What 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 would you see in uh, vice versa the EU? I mean, I, I can only speak to uh, uh, sort of some of the other regulations that we had. And normally, uh, it, it, it Switzerland does um, uh, try to be compliant uh, because it's, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Switzerland's trading partner landscape, Europe uh, uh, still is the biggest, you know, trading partner, uh, just uh, followed by the US and then a few others. So, so it's quite important that we can deal with those countries around makes it also quite attractive because you're in the middle of Europe and and that trading um, partnerships exist. I, I think, as I mentioned before, where I normally like it is that there uh, th there is always a little bit of interpretation on how to use certain regulations, and and I think that's where Switzerland particularly uses a, a very pragmatic uh, economy supporting. A uh, view uh, with the AI Act. I must admit, uh, it's so, so early days. Of course, those claims going to be made. We want to be compliant. Uh, you know, I frankly and, and Fabio, uh, Carlo, maybe you're even closer to it. But uh, but I personally think that it's it's uh, it's still the jury is still out. It's it uh, meant to be seen on on how actually to get that balance right. You know, to not stifle innovation but make sure that people are protected very much how uh, the the data protection law and gdpr aims for i hope actually that uh, I, uh, ibm that switzerland follows the, the the good practice from the past and this means it's intent regulation and it's not technology regulation yeah. so that uh, it gives you some freedom of developing technology but within some guidelines but uh, as it is as early on and Switzerland tends to be not the first one in coming up with, with regulations, um, but I, I hope they, they uh, handle it the same way as they did it with, with other technology discussions around blockchain. I think we've seen it, it worked out very well and, and uh, with some human sense. <laughs> To, if you can even use that word in in that uh, context, but I'm I'm positive and looking forward that we come up with something pragmatic, like uh, Roger just mentioned. Before uh, going to you, Colin, one of the questions that also came up, and I think we have a lot of discussion now about the the, the legal framework. Uh, someone is asking, what about the AI e e ecosystem in Switzerland? How capable is it? Uh, do you see adoption of those those solutions? I, I just like to to uh, reiterate to everyone. I recently, uh, early this year, I was at a conference in Paris where Jan LeCun spoke. Jan LeCun is uh, Meta's head of AI. is a very well known professor, Turing Prize winner, and on stage he was asked, which are the leading ecosystem when it comes to AI? in research and development and obviously he said us and he said france because he's french <laughs> and he said switzerland so he uh, one of the leading people in this sector acknowledged unprompted on stage that switzerland has a lot of k capabilities so maybe we can address that a bit later uh, as well what are the capabilities we have here that are important as well but colin you wanted to respond before that uh and maybe i can tie those together a little bit too which uh See the 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 question, Alexander. The the topic really around data sovereignty, right? Today, why do we care at all about data sovereignty, or why it matters? And I think sometimes we forget that uh, data is an asset. I think uh, Roger and others, kind of, Sir Carl and Fabi, were touching on this, and I think it's important to, if we, you know, we if we were talking about gold or oil or crop something physical, we wouldn't be saying, well, should we care about where it's at, who owns it, right? But, uh, you know, somehow digital data is a little intangible, you can't touch it, it's, you know, on a hard drive. So, so, so now we have to ask, do we care who owns it and where it goes? 
but it is super valuable. And you only have to look at the largest market capitalization companies in the world. In the last 30 years, Google, Amazon, Meta, these are trillion dollar market cap companies who, where is it, what was the value? It was the data, right, that drove it. You know, it wasn't that Amazon sold a lot of uh, uh, sponges or laptops, it was the data that drove the success of these companies. And the reason that data sovereignty matters is because that value should accrue really, we have a firm belief, it is belief, not a law, but it, we have a value that the data, the, the value of that data should accrue to those who generate the data, those who own the data, those not just to a single party. So data sovereignty matters at a national level because it could, you know, it's a, the, the laws that govern to make sure that data and uh, value does accrue to the right people. Um, and in a way, actually, it should, uh, we, 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 Switzerland's a great democracy also and, you know, long history of making sure, you know, the value does flow to the individuals who, uh, you know, for the right reasons. And so we, we think there's another reason behind data sovereignty matters because of the, the economic benefits and the protection of the law matters like the AI Act or others where um, you want to ensure that the, the, it's used in the correct way with that and uh, each time and every time uh, as that data becomes more valuable. Maybe if we're going to you, Carla, um, I'm just encouraging the audience, if you have any other questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll read them uh, before we're going to finish at nine o'clock. But Carla, you want to respond as well? Yes. Um, so what I wanted to bring in, um, adding up to Colin's point, if you think about how technology within a company has evolved, let's say 15, 20 years ago, Data and technology was something you had to do to run your business, but it was like a side element. It was a, it's, it's, it's not the main, it, it was not like your business was running on something else and it was just a supporting function, right? And then I'd say 15 years ago, it became more relevant, more important. You thought about, okay, this is eating up a lot of my budget. This is um, difficult to execute. So somehow you decided that technology needs to be part of the, the management team, at least. So you developed roles like CTOs, you developed um, people who are really sitting at the table. And today, if you're founding a new company today, I think it will be driven by technology always. So technology has developed from a support function to a decisive role inside any company today. And this is also what AI brings in to the landscape today. So, I mean, if, if you would found a company today, it is not possible to do it without a very savvy technology, uh, a very savvy technology person that will help you set up a greenfield business based on the latest, best and, and most efficient technology, right? So if you think about this today, like early days, there was data, somebody had servers below their table and somehow we were storing data on the server. We didn't know how it works. Then came the professionalization of, of this whole data storage uh, industry where you said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. It's more secure if I have this done by specialists and you outsource to cloud providers, to data centers who were taking care of your data. Now with AI, your data will become so incredibly important that you will have to think about whether you really want to have third parties taking care of this service for you. So it can be that in 10 years from now, companies will strategically decide to host their data themselves again, of course, inside of data centers um, and special facilities, but with their own teams, with their own specialists, because data is going to be so incredibly more important. So um, I just wanted to highlight this development in, in, in perception of technology and data in general. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yeah. In the interest of time, Roger is going to yeah. have the final word, I guess, before. Oh, OK, <laughs> so I have to make it count. I, I really just wanted to answer the question, are we ready, right? And and so I think uh, the, my first point would have been necessity. So uh, Carla perfectly uh, covered that. So it, it is 
necessary to do this because uh, IT and tech uh, and AI is going to be fundamental to everything. I think if we look at the infrastructure landscape, we do have a very healthy infrastructure set up. We do have uh, a data center landscape that's vibrant, even if you compare by sort of Capita versus data center, which of course is not quite fair given it's a small nation, but but we do have a very healthy sort of uh, capacity distribution. Um, the, the strong regulatory body that we had in Switzerland through the banking industry, but also pharma and others, really drove security, a very healthy security awareness, lots of uh, great security solutions from abroad, uh, uh, like with Colin, and, and, but also local. And I, I think what and the last thing is sort of service availability. And if I look at the service availability, what I really like is, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a strong global footprint, so you get all sorts of solutions, of course, the ones from the West, you know, particularly the US, uh, but you also get a lot of the Eastern solution available in Switzerland and you get local things, you know, whether it's a uh, quantum compute, whether it's the stuff that Phoenix does, I IBM deploys as well. So it's a very rich environment. And, and, then, and then last but not least, having the academia that sort of propels the, the innovation and trying stuff out. And I think for me, I'm very excited, you know, uh, about what uh, AI brings to us as a nation, but uh, as a globe and, and, and finally humanity, you know, it's going to be, it, it is the next big thing. Perfect. With that, I'd like to close off and hand over to Sirpa. What just on a very personal uh, experience level, uh, what Carlos said, I experienced myself. I used to work for LGT Bank, a private bank owned by the Prince family. And and back then, when uh, IT was a topic, basically the mindset of a banker was IT, that's the guy I call when the printer doesn't work. That's sort mm -hmm. of, you know, that's IT in a company. And bloody hell, if it doesn't work, he has to come in two minutes and they get really upset. And interestingly, recently they hired a new CEO, LGT in Switzerland. And the CEO uh, used to do at UBS innovation. Uh, it was is a lady, Anke Bricot, who is very steeped in technology and innovation. So it shows this culture shift, even in banking, from sort of, you know, data is something we need to protect. So to something that we need to work with, technology we need to develop. I think it's a clear sign. We're on this journey and Switzerland has a lot to offer. With that, Sirpa, handing over to you. Thank you so much, Alexander, and also Colin, Fabio, Carla, Roger, um, for that really insightful discussion about data um, as an asset. So I guess, yes, um, it's going to keep a lot of uh, companies and company executives still um, up on their feet and um, to, to see like how the global data strategy that they have to implement. And if you're interested in learning more about Switzerland and how in that global data strategy, uh, you can use Switzerland as a location and the innovation ecosystem we have here and the service providers and the talent, uh, please have a look at um, on our website. We have more information or get directly in touch with us. You see here on a slide uh, the email address and yes, with this, um, thank you for the speakers and thank you, Alexander, for moderating. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I, with this, I would like to close the call. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.